there it is. Uh, and with that, I will pass things off to Megan. Thank you very much, Megan. All right, thanks, Nick. Um, hi, everyone, and welcome to this evening's presentation, Stories and Structures, Winneka's Architectural Treasures. Um, as Nick mentioned, my name is Megan McChesty. I am the curator at the Winneka Historical Society. Um, I'm so excited to be sharing this fascinating part of Winneka's history with all of you tonight. Um, I want to thank the library for hosting us this evening. This presentation will discuss some of the village's historic structures, including some fun and interesting facts about the people who designed them, lived in them, and worked in them. So before we begin, I want to briefly share a bit about the Winneka Historical Society and what it is that we do. WHS is a nonprofit organization, and our mission is to honor and preserve the village's heritage and gather and share the artifacts and stories of its past. We have a few particularly exciting things going on this year. Um, we recently launched our in-school field trip program called Amazing Artifacts, where children have the opportunity to use deductive reasoning skills and work in groups to figure out what the artifact is, and what it was used for. We have also partnered with the public library, again, to digitize and make searchable our collection of the Winneka Talk, which dates back to 1913. So we're really grateful to the library and really excited about that. We also recently launched our architecture tour program, which I'll tell you a little bit more about after the presentation. Um, and with that said, let's get started. Our first historic structure is arguably my favorite, personal favorite uh, house in Winneka, the Victorian Gothic at 594 Elm, which was designed for Samuel and Mary Shackford in 1872. Samuel Shackford was quite an interesting and accomplished man by the time he died in the home in 1908. He was born in Eastport, Maine in 1821 and was a relative of Abraham Lincoln. Uh, he became a sea captain at an early age, and in 1851, he married Mary Tinkham. Two years later, the couple moved to Chicago. Like many Chicagoans, the Shackbirds lost their home on North LaSalle in the Great Chicago Fire of 1871. They moved into the house at 608 Elm in Winneka, presuming that the move would be temporary until the city recovered from the disaster. The Shackbirds fell in love with the newly founded village of Winneka, however, and decided to purchase the land next door from Artemis Carter to build their own permanent home. They hired a Chicago-based architect named L. Lyman to design the house. After the house was built, the Shackbirds settled into life in Winneka and became very active members of the community. Samuel served as the police magistrate uh, for many years and served as village president in 1877. So interestingly, their daughter, Elizabeth Lincoln Shackford, married architect William Otis, and they lived down the street from the Shackfords at 644 Oak. Otis, uh, William Otis, designed several historic buildings in Winneka, including um, Christ Church and the Lloyd Memorial Library, which was the predecessor building to the current library building. Five ninety four Elm remains one of the best preserved older houses in Winneka. Many of the original Victorian Gothic elements still remain today, including the gingerbread scroll scroll work um, on the porch and above the windows, uh, the carved decorative barge boards and eaves around the roof line, and the vertical wooden clapboard siding.
These decorative features elevate this house from what would otherwise be a largely vernacular uh, Victorian structure. So because of its style and its very long interesting history, 594 Elm became Winneka's first local landmark in 2010. Our next surprising structure um, is 801 Oak Street, uh, which I think will be pretty familiar to most people. As one of Winneka's longest running businesses, it's very hard to imagine the building at 801 Oak without the iconic Bratchy plumbing name and storefront. Um, but when Bratchy opened for business in the 1930s, its Oak Street building had already been around for about 20 years. This tall, slim structure at 801 Oak, uh, which was originally 803 Oak, uh, was first built in around 18, or excuse me, 1907 by John T. Brady, who was a young yet pretty experienced blacksmith uh, from Evanston. Brady operated his blacksmith and horseshoe shop on the bottom floor, and he and his wife, Mary lived in the two bedroom apartment above the shop with their four children. Around the same time, uh, just a few blocks north, William P. Happ purchased a blacksmith shop at the corner of Chestnut and Spruce. Blacksmithing was um, arguably in William Happ's blood. He was the grandson of Winnetka's first blacksmith, John Happ, who opened a shop at Maple and Elm in 1843. So William Happ ran a successful business on Spruce until the 1920s when he struck a deal with John Brady to merge their two blacksmithing businesses. Um, so Hap sold the building at 826 Spruce and moved his business to Brady's location at 801 Oak. Uh, the business was then renamed the Hap and Brady Practical Horseshoers. So while the need for horseshoes diminished as fewer horses could be seen on Winneka streets, uh, the blacksmith shop remained in business by focusing more on other types of blacksmithing work like uh, decorative metals. The blacksmithing shop stayed in business until around the 1930s when John Brady passed away. In 1939, the building was rented to Walter Bracci, um, a local Winnecan and experienced plumber. Walter Bracci was born in Switzerland in 1886 and immigrated to Chicago in 1904. He started working as a plumber for the Rupert J. Weber Company, which was a large company with offices on uh, Clark Street. In 1924, Bracci moved to Winneka and built the house at 688 Cherry. He continued to work for the Weber Company until he passed his master plumbing examination at the age of 50. He opened Bracci Plumbing in 1937. Uh, he first ran the business out of his house at 688 Cherry until 1939 when he rented the building at 801 Oak from Mary Brown Brady, John Brady's widow. Bracci continued to rent 801 Oak until 1947 when he purchased the building. That same year, Bracci's daughter, Norma, met and married Phil Hosa Jr., who started working for the Bracci business. While the building underwent some changes to accommodate the plumbing business, some of the original features from the blacksmithing business still remain, um, including the stable flooring and hooks used to tie up horses that were being fitted for horseshoes. Elements of the fireplace seen in this image uh, from the 1920s remain as well.
1952, the showroom in front of the original building was added, and in 1982, the addition at 803 Oak was built. Since 1937, four generations of the Bratshe family have worked for the business, um, including WHS sustaining board member Phil Hosa and his daughters, Betsy and Carrie. Uh, Carrie is a current WHS board member. Thanks to the Bratchy and Hosa family, the historic building at 801 Oak has not only been transformed, but also well-preserved and cared for for over 115 years. Our next structure located at 42 Abbotsford is also known as the Orth House and was built in 1908. Uh, this concrete and stucco prairie school home was designed by prolific local architect Walter Burley Griffin. So I'll first tell you a little bit about Griffin. He was born in Maywood, Illinois in 1876, um, an admirer of famed architect Louis Sullivan. Griffin was inspired to work as an architect himself and received his bachelor's degree in architecture from the University of Illinois in 1899. After college, Griffin returned to Chicago and worked as a draftsman in the offices of Dwight Perkins, Robert Spencer, and H. Webster Tomlinson, who were three of Chicago's budding Prairie School architects. In 1901, Griffin received his architect's license and began working in Frank Lloyd Wright's uh, famous Oak Park studio. While working for Wright, Griffin honed his craft, and in 1906, he established his own architectural practice. Over the next seven years, Griffin designed over 100 homes and buildings, several of which are located on the North Shore and across Chicago land. Griffin married another architect from Wright's studio, uh, Marion Mahoney, in 1911, um, whom he worked with in partnership um, until his death in 1937. Together, the Griffins designed much of Canberra, which is the capital city of Australia. Griffin also designed several historic homes in Winneka, including 62 Warwick, uh, which was built in 1904, uh, 460 Hill, which was built in 1912, um, 982 Pine, which was built in 1908, and 82 Exit Essex, which was built in 1911 and was unfortunately demolished just recently. Griffin designed 42 Abbotsford in conjunction with the house next door at 38 Abbotsford. Um, these houses, which are essentially mirror images of one another, were designed for William S. Orth as spec properties. Um, Orth was a Chicago-based doctor. Um, he was the brother-in-law of William F. Temple, who was a developer who Griffin worked with frequently um, including on several properties in the southern part of Winneka near the Kenilworth border. Built early in his career, the Orth houses are particularly representative of Griffin's early affinity for the prairie style, uh, made famous by his mentor, Frank Lloyd Wright. But as the public increasingly compared Griffin's work to Wright's, uh, he shifted away from strictly prairie style designs later in his career. In 1935, he and Marion were hired to design a new library for Lucknow University in Northwest India. With the library's success, commissions began pouring in and Griffin had a short but successful career in India. Um, unfortunately, just two years into his practice in India, um, he died of an infection. The Orth House at 42 Abbotsford is one of several of Griffin's works listed on the National Register of Historic Places. 
It was added to the registry in 1976, uh, which is quite early, and remains one of Winnetka's architectural treasures today. Uh, thankfully, its twin house at 38 Abbotsford still stands by its side. So our next house at 779 Bryant was designed by famed architect Howard Van Doren Shaw in 1909. A little bit about Shaw. He was born in Chicago in 1869, uh, raised in the quite upscale historic Prairie Avenue district on the south side of the city. Um, he likely had an appreciation for high-end architectural style at a very young age. After attending Yale and MIT, he returned to Chicago and in 1894 established his own practice. Three years later, he designed an arts and crafts style house uh, called Ragdale for himself and his family, which is located in Lake Forest. Ragdale is now considered one of the best examples of the arts and crafts style um, and is listed on the National Register of Historic Places. He also became well known for designing country houses in Chicago land and influenced many of the next generation of Chicago architects. So Shaw designed 779 Bryant in Winneka for Albert Kales, a law professor at Northwestern and Harvard. Uh, Kales is best known for his 1914 book, Unpopular Government in the United States. Um, I checked and it is still available on Amazon if anyone is interested in checking that out. After Kale sold 779 Bryant in 1920, it changed hands a few times before it was purchased by Walter Leroy and Marie Antoinette Haskell, who lived there from 1962 through 1979. Um, I contacted the current homeowners who gave me some interesting information about the Haskells. Uh, Mrs. Haskell has a particularly interesting story. Um, she was born Marie Antoinette von Korf Kersenbrock in Czechoslovakia. Uh, she was the daughter of Count Clement Korf Kersenbrock and Countess Marie Anna. During World War II, Marie Antoinette was imprisoned at a labor camp in Germany where she was forced to help build airplanes. Uh, family members have since said that she tried to sabotage the Nazi planes that she worked on in the camp. After the war, she returned to Czechoslovakia and worked as a translator for the American Underground Network. The communist government there found out about her work and facing a warrant for her arrest, she fled to Austria in 1949. Um, the next year, she received a student visa and scholarship to a college in Lake Forest. Two years later, President Harry Truman signed a bill making her a permanent U.S. resident. Uh, once in Illinois, she married, she met and married um, Walter Lee Roy Haskell and in 1962 purchased the house at 779 Bryant. In 1979, they sold the house and moved to Glenview. So after the Haskells moved, 779 Bryant changed hands a few times before the current owners purchased this beautiful historic home in 1993. The house is one of Shaw's uh, relatively few designs in Winneka and draws from a number of architectural styles. Very little has changed on the exterior since it was completed in 1910, though the open porches on the south facade were enclosed and in 2012, a family room was added. Thanks to the thoughtful care and renovations done by its owners over, the over time, 779 Bryant retains much of its original integrity and is now a designated Winneka landmark. So now we're moving on to discuss a few more of my personal favorite houses in Winneka, the Swedish houses on Tower and Greenwood. 
Um, even though, even in a village with a vast array of architectural styles, these Swedish cottage style homes stand out. The curved thatch and sod roofing and stonework give these houses a whimsical look, uh, generally only seen in Sweden or in the Cotswolds in England. The designer of these charming cottages was builder and artist Andrew Paulson. Uh, born in Sweden, Paulson and his wife Augusta immigrated to Chicago in the late 19th century. One of his first jobs in the city was at the 1893 Columbian Exposition, though it's unclear what job or role he played in the fair. Um, but whatever his position entailed, it clearly opened doors for him, and he soon, <coughs> excuse me, found work with well-to-do Chicagoans like developer and businessman uh, Potter Palmer, who built the famous Palmer House Hotel. As more and more wealthy Chicagoans moved out of the city to the North Shore, Paulson followed suit. Uh, he and Augusta moved to Winnetka in 1905, where they lived until 1939. Um, while living in Winnetka, Paulson envisioned a village of homes inspired by the farmhouse cottages he saw in Sweden growing up. He purchased the lots on the corner of Tower and Greenwood for $200 to $300 around 1920 and began designing his collection of whimsical houses. The first of the Swedish cottages built was 900 Greenwood, uh, which was completed in 1922. Uh, this is a picture of 900 Greenwood upon its completion. Uh, we think Paulson is likely in the photograph, but uh, we don't know what he looks like, so we don't know which person he might be. The house is a log and stucco structure with a thatched roof typical of the southern Swedish countryside. Uh, one fun fact about this house, it briefly found fame when it was featured as the Scrooge's house in one of the English film productions of A Christmas Carol. Uh, Paulson originally designed 900 Greenwood for himself and his family. In 1927, he told the Winneka Talk that he never planned to sell it outside the family. Um, instead, he hoped to pass it on to his children <clears throat> and grandchildren for generations to come. While the Paulsons did eventually sell the house outside the family, it has thankfully remained in the hands of owners who have preserved its original design and integrity. Um, in 1996, the house won a Winneka Preservation Award for the stylistically appropriate wing added to the front of the house. While living at 900 Greenwood, Paulson designed and built 902 Greenwood in 1926 as a coach house and as a studio for himself. The style is in line with that of 900 Greenwood, yet Paulson differentiated the structure with a cedar and asphalt roof. Uh, 902 Greenwood is one of two Paulson houses that is a designated Winneka landmark. Shortly after completing his first two Swedish houses, Paulson broke ground on the third at 890 Greenwood. This house combines several of the features of its predecessors at 900 and 902 Greenwood with the stone and stucco siding and traditional thatched roof. The other Paulson house that is now a Winneka landmark, uh, 1479 Tower, was built in 1929. The stone and wood frame exterior of the house, along with the tiled roof with straight roof lines, makes this house just a little bit more modern in appearance uh, than those on Greenwood, yet certainly no less charming. Mm -hmm. 
completing this house at the start of the Great Depression likely made it difficult for Paulson to find a buyer, and the house was vacant for uh, several years. Paulson eventually rented it out and later sold the property to the first of many dedicated homeowners who have collectively preserved this house for over a century, or for almost a century, I should say. The final Paulson Swedish house at 1487 Power was completed in 1930. Like several of the houses, 1487 Tower is constructed of stucco, stone, and thatched roofing. According to an article in the Winnetka Talk, Paulson meticulously chose the stones for this house to ensure the colors aligned with his vision for the design. Almost a century later, the Swedish houses Paulson designed remain just as beloved by residents of Winneka and beyond. Our final surprising structures are another collection of structures, uh, the John T. Dale Victorian houses on Linden and Ridge. The remaining Dale houses are not only some of Winneka's most beautiful, um, but they are also some of its oldest. Born in England in 1841, John Dale immigrated to the U.S. in 1849, uh, first living in Salem, Wisconsin, before settling in Chicago in 1862. Once in Chicago, Dale started studying law and working as a clerk in an attorney's office. Um, in 1865, he became a lawyer focusing on real estate law. And in 1870, he married uh, Layla W. Graves of Chicago and moved to Winnetka. By 1872, Dale had started investing in local real estate he purchased a large swath of land just south of Willow Road with the intent of developing it into a housing subdivision. That year, he built his own home within the subdivision on the southwest corner of Willow and Linden, which is now 352 Linden. Our records indicate that Dale hired his father, Thomas, to build his home. Uh, Thomas was a master carpenter, which is someone who is highly skilled as both an architect and a builder. Uh, while we don't know for sure, it is likely or possible that Thomas built, uh, both designed and built, all of the John T. Dale houses in Winneka before he died in his son's home in Winneka in 1880. While living in Winneka, both uh, Dale's law and real estate careers flourished. He eventually became the head of his own law firm with offices uh, first in the old, well, the second Tribune building um, and later in the historic Unity building, which stood at 127 North Dearborn until it was torn down in 1989. He also helped Platt, uh, much of the village of Winneka, and is credited with naming uh, several of its streets. In addition to practicing law and developing real estate, Dale was also um, accomplished as a writer and local government leader. He wrote a book on morals for young men, which eventually became required reading for all of the male students at New Trier High School. He also served as the second president of the village of Winneka from 1873 to 1874. Um, remarkably, Dale served two additional terms as village president in his lifetime from 1876 to 1877, and again from 1887 to 1888. In 1882, Dale sold the house at 352 Linden, but he did not go far. 
He moved within his original subdivision, uh, one block west to a similar Italianate house um, that he had built at 352 Ridge. The Dales lived at 352 Ridge for over 20 years before moving back to Chicago around 1905. Um, sadly, this beautiful Italianate home was demolished in 1967. So back over to 352 Linden, um, this house changed hands several times before it was purchased by Edward C. Kohler in 1906. Um, like Dale and some of the other um, homeowners that we've met tonight, Kohler served as village president, uh, serving in the position from 1906 to 1907. Unfortunately, we don't have any really early photos of 352 Linden, so we can't be certain if any alterations have ever been made. Um, that said, because the 1914 Sanborn Fire Insurance map shows the house with roughly the, the same size and shape uh, that it has today, it's likely that it appears much today as it did when it was originally built. Perhaps the most significant alteration to the exterior occurred in 1930 when the front porch was enclosed. Um, in 1979, several of the interior rooms were also renovated. Still, most elements of the house uh, likely remain in their original form. The Italianate detailed trim around the roof line uh, likely remains as it did in 1872. Uh, in addition, this house still maintains the signature Italianate cupola on the roof. So in addition to 352 Linden and 352 Ridge, uh, Dale built a third Italianate home at 326 Ridge. Um, while it's unclear who first purchased this property from Dale, we do know that in 1886, it was purchased by the Goss family who owned it for over 30 years. In 1929, the Goss family sold 326 Ridge to Park Phipps, who was an artist who taught classes at the Art Institute of Chicago. Phipps lived there for over 20 years and did several updates to the house, um, including removing the front porch. He also converted the barn into a coach house in 1941. In 1975, the house was purchased by the current homeowners uh, who underwent a large scale restoration of the house. So thanks to their care and appreciation for its history, 326 Ridge maintains um, several quintessential Italianate characteristics, including the gently sloping roof, um, the distinctive wide eaves with decorative brackets around the overhang and the bay windows. Our final house is the fourth John T. Dale uh, house at 328 Linden, which is a beautiful Victorian that Dale built for his in-laws, uh, Riley and Ruth Graves in 1873. Riley Graves was well-known locally as the owner of the Graves General Store, which opened in 1855 on the corner of present day Green Bay and Elm. Uh, where the Chase Bank is today. Graves sold the store to Robert Moth in 1875, who then uh, sold it to local grocer and banker Max Meyer in 1882.
When Ruth and Riley Graves died in the early 1900s, the house passed to their daughter, Grace, who owned it until the 1920s. From 1908 to 1920, Grace uh, rented the house to a number of people, including uh, well-known activist Lola Maverick Lloyd. Uh, Lola, Lola Maverick Lloyd filed for divorce from her husband, William Bross Lloyd, who was the son of Henry Demarest Lloyd um, in 1916 and was awarded full custody of their children. Uh, she and her children moved out of the Lloyd house at 830 Sheridan and lived in the Graves house at 328 Linden until their historic home at 455 Birch was completed in 1920. So since the Graves house, since the Graves sold the house, uh, several alterations have been made. In the 1940s, the porches were removed, and in 1951, a library and bathroom were added on the north side of the house. Um, in 1960, the terrace on the south side was added. So thanks to its current owners, 328 Linden remains one of Monaco's uh, most interesting and attractive Victorian houses. So I hope you enjoyed learning about some of these historic structures. Um, I'd now like to introduce you to our new architecture tour program, which offers several ways to learn even more about Winneka's fascinating architectural treasures. We are offering a variety of for tour formats. Um, so there are several ways to embark on another architectural adventure around this historic village. We are now offering in-person guided walking and jogging tours, um, which will be led by WHS staff. These tours offer an exciting opportunity to learn about some of some more of Winneka's most interesting structures uh, while standing right in front of the structures themselves. Uh, the walking and jogging tours will also include several points of interest um, between each stop and en route to each stop. So you'll be able to learn about even more of the village's architectural gems. We currently have two tours scheduled. Um, the Central Winneka walking tour on Thursday, May 4th at 4 p.m. Uh, we still have a few spots left on that tour. Um, and the Hubbard Woods jogging tour on Saturday, May 13th at 10 a.m. Um, and we have several spots left for that tour as well. You can sign up for both of these on our website. Um, we are also offering private group tours. So if you'd prefer to schedule a tour for just your family or your friends, um, you can contact us about that as well. We have also created an app-based tour program that will allow you to take our architectural tours on your own time at your own pace. Uh, the app uses geotagging technology to identify where your phone is and how close you are to each stop on the tour. So as you approach each stop, the app will automatically pull up the information um, about that stop and browse uh, historic, allow you to browse historic images of the structure while you're standing there right in front of it. Um, I've taken a little video of myself uh, walking between stops to show you how it works. So I'll just show you a quick clip here. This is my dog, Sawyer. So it's really simple. Once you download and open the app, um, you can just click standard tour mode if you are doing the tour in person um, and you literally just start walking. Um, if you want to do free roam mode, you can start at any of the stops. Uh, you don't have to start at number one, but I work at 411 Linden, so um, that's where I started. The Winnetka Historical Society's headquarters at 411 Linden was first built as early as 1859 on land that was owned by Charles Peck, who is largely considered the founder of Winnetka. The house is considered to be one of Winnetka's best examples of the Victorian era Gothic revival style which was inspired by the medieval cathedrals of Europe. While it has undergone some changes, many of the original Gothic revival features still remain today, including the pitched roof, the original doors with the teardrop windows, and the gingerbread decorations.
So you can see on the screen now, I'm the little blue dot. Um, so as you start walking, um, it moves you along. And once you get close to the next stop, it automatically pulls it up. So it's a pretty cool, um, it's a pretty cool app. You can also use this app uh, to take a virtual tour anytime, anywhere. In order to do this, you just uh, open the Pocket Sites app uh, and click on the settings button in the top right corner, uh, then switch to virtual tour mode. This will take you through the tour anywhere without having to actually physically walk to the sites. Um, you can find more detailed instructions on how to download and use the Pocket Sites app either in person or virtually um, on our website. One great added bonus of the Pocket Sites app is um, that the app also provides access to thousands of free tours all over the world um, that just like ours can be taken virtually or in person. Um, so here are just a few examples of tours that I've taken um, that you can have access to when you download the app. And finally, you can also take the tour virtually on your computer by using the Pocket Sites website. Uh, the website will not walk you through the tour like the app will, but instead allows you to click on the stops at your own pace um, in whatever order you choose. So thank you all for joining us. Um, if you have any questions about these structures or anything else about Winneka's history, you can visit our website. You can visit us in person on Tuesdays and Thursdays from 1 to 4 p.m. or by appointment. Um, or you can email me at curator at winnekahistory.org. Um, I also just wanted to let you know that we are currently looking for volunteers for to work at the Schmidt Burnham Log House this summer. Um, it's going to be open from April 30th through November 19th. We only ask that volunteers uh, volunteer six Sundays throughout the entire open season. So it's pretty minimal commitment and it's a lot of fun. Um, so if you're interested, you can email our program coordinator at programs at WinnekaHistory.org or you can always just call us or contact me. All right, thank you very much, Megan. Uh, that was very interesting. Uh, you had some super cool picks in there. Uh, and thank you to those of you in attendance uh, for sharing the time. I'm going to uh, attempt to publish a little Zoom poll here, uh, just asking how many people uh, were viewing kind of behind the screen, uh, just because the library uses our attendance numbers uh, to determine what programming to offer and not to offer in the future. Uh, all right. Uh, thank you very much. And we will see you all next time.